We will get started um, by having our panelists, um, our, our three distinguished panelists, uh, talk a little bit about their work um, and sort of get the ball rolling on some of the substantive issues that we want to put on the table today. So let me just very briefly introduce them. Uh, first, we have Nani Janssen Reventlo, who is the founding director of the Digital Freedom Fund and has been a, an advisor to the clinic since 2016. Um, Nani co-teaches a class at Columbia Law School with Jan Yigintu, um, who also teaches at Georgetown and Koch University in Turkey, and is a barrister at four New Square Chambers in London, practices commercial law and human rights law. Uh, we also have Vivek Krishnamurthy, late of the Cyber Law Clinic, <laughs> presently uh, counsel at Foley Hoag, um, whose practice is in corporate social responsibility, um, and who has engaged with these issues across the spectrum. Uh, so, um, also want to remind folks we are um, uh, video recording and live broadcasting this event. Um, so in the event that you ask a question, we're going to ask you to use the mic and just keep in mind um, that you will be on tape um, for that section. Uh, we're going to try to keep the discussion piece of the talk to like 35 or 40 minutes and then open up for questions. Um, so uh, if you have burning questions before then, by all means raise your hand, uh, but know that there will be time at the end as well. So um, perhaps we can get started, Nani, with you. Could you talk a little bit about the Digital Freedom Fund and the role of strategic litigation in advancing these questions? Sure. So we can just talk like this without the microphone. Oh, so actually, we probably should have them. Yeah. <laughs> so I probably wasn't caught any of them. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Whoever's just Sorry. tuning in, we had a really interesting conversation <laughs> up to this point. <laughs> Key issues have been discussed, and this is just, yeah, exactly, yeah. This, this is great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to, to tell you a little bit about the Digital Freedom Fund, uh, which was founded about a year ago um, to uh, support strategic litigation on digital rights in Europe. Um, the organization was founded uh, based on um, an expressed wish from the digital rights field uh, in Europe to do more with strategic litigation, to put more effort into that to advance digital rights uh, in the region. And by digital rights, um, we mean human rights in online and network spaces, so the full range of, of, of human rights as you would find it, for example, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so we started a process in which we uh, spoke to all the different actors in the field to hear what their needs were. And also based on their input, we set uh, a number of uh, thematic focus areas uh, for our litigation support. Uh, the idea is, of course, that strategic litigation means, per definition, that it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's litigation married to other efforts, so campaigning, uh, advocacy work, uh, and, and other efforts. Um, and that actually ties in nicely with the work that I did here at the Berkman Klein Center uh, when I was a fellow um, in uh, 2016 to 2017, um, where I looked at um, uh, collaboration across different disciplines in strategic litigation, in strategic cases. How can you get lawyers, activists, technical experts, and advocacy people to work together and actually have more impact in their work. Um, so we ended up devising a really nice website called the Catalysts for Collaboration, where you have case studies of good examples uh, where that happened, but also distilling a number of best practices for people to keep in mind when they work on strategic cases. Um, for the Digital Freedom Fund, we now focus on three thematic focus areas. Uh, one is, is privacy. Uh, the second is the free flow of information online. And the third is um, uh, accountability and transparency when looking at, and the adherence to human rights standards when looking at the application and design and development of technology. Um, and I guess we can talk about you know, two examples uh, specifically uh, today, uh, given the expertise that is in the room. Um, one issue I would want to flag is, is the GDPR, which of course ties into the privacy aspect, um, but also uh, surveillance, which is what uh, Jan will be able to uh, tell you more about and in, in specific case that he has done. And I think Vivek will tie in the transatlantic aspect um, of it all. Um, so the GDPR, I'm sure you've been um, bombarded with uh, reflections on that and whether or not it's interesting, relevant and useful. We think so, on the other side of the ocean anyway. Uh, <laughs> the GDPR um, 
is a really uh, interesting and useful tool to really give teeth, right, to enforcing your right to privacy. Um, it's a human rights based document. Um, it doesn't kind of, it's not that much reflected in the more technical articles that you will find in the GDPR itself, but in the recital, you can very clearly see that it's very much rooted uh, in the right to your private, have your, protect your private life, right? Um, and um, it gives, the GDPR itself gives a lot of opportunities to basically be able to enforce that because it enshrines, um, it, it lists a number of uh, clear rights that you have as an individual and possibilities to enforce them vis-a-vis -vis private entities whose obligations are also really clearly listed in the GDPR. Um, I made a little list here of all the rights that you have under the GDPR. That's the right to be informed. It's the right to have access to your data, to request ratification and also erasure under certain circumstances. You can restrict the way that in your personal data are being processed. Um, you have the right to data portability, meaning that you can take your data from one provider to another. Um, you have the right to object against the processing of your personal data. And you also have specific rights in relation to automated decision making and profiling, uh, which is really important, of course, um, with all the developments in that um, area. What obligations do parties have on the other hand, right? The private uh, entities, they have the uh, right, they have the obligation that the data processing must be lawful, fair and transparent. Um, they can only collect data for spe specified purposes that they have to get your explicit consent for beforehand. Um, they have to process the minimum viable number of, of data and it has to be accurate, and they cannot keep it longer than is strictly necessary for the purposes for which the data were collected, which is a really important point as well. Plus that it also puts obligations for security uh, on the private entities. They have to make sure that the data remain confidential and that, they, um, that, they are, uh, that their integrity is protected. So I think today there was an, a nice news report about Marriott's uh, loyalty program. Um, Things like that <laughs> should not happen, um, uh, in more ways than one anyway. But um, companies have to show that they're compliant with the GDPR. So what did we see so far case-wise? Uh, well, very um, a case that was very high profile in the news because it was filed the day that the GDPR entered into force was a case that Mark Schrems filed against uh, Facebook and Google, uh, basically targeting that issue of consent, right? Many companies kind of use kind of obscure terms and conditions um, and uh, don't really give you a choice uh, as to whether or not to consent to the processing of your data. And um, Max Trems has filed a case challenging exactly that of two of the biggest platforms, right? And why does this have a potential to have uh, more teeth than perhaps previous cases is that under the GDPR, you can um, get fines imposed on the companies of about 4% of the annual uh, turnover of a company. That's going to kind of run into pretty big numbers uh, if you look at uh, the amount of money that uh, the Facebooks and Googles of this world uh, make. There are some examples pre-GDPR that were of good cases that were handed down in this kind of regime. Um, the, um, the Data Protection uh, Commissioner in the UK uh, handed down a fine uh, against Facebook uh, for its uh, involvement in the Cambridge Analytica scandal of about half a million pounds, which was the highest that you could get before the GDPR regime. So, you know, well, interesting to kind of see how that develops now that we have the GDPR. Uh, the Data Protection Authority in, in France uh, fined an ad tech company uh, for basically not um, allowing people to give explicit consent. They had really complicated terms and conditions. People weren't actually sure what they were signing up for and their data were being shared with other ad tech companies. And um, if you want to look at uh, ad tech um, companies and how creepy they are, um, Privacy International has a really informative uh, piece of that on their website to explain exactly how that works and how the sharing of data and putting them together again um, has an impact on your privacy. And um, in the UK recently, um, an, a plan was abandoned uh, to use patient data that were collected by the National Health Service um, to basically report people who were suspected of being in violation of immigration rules. And that was because the conversation really got started because the UK was implementing the GDPR nationally. And um, um, 
an organization called the Migrants uh, Rights Network, together with Liberty, threatened to file a case on this. So that also shows like how, you know, just by threatening uh, some solid litiga litigation, you can already kind of change practice uh, and policy. I will now stop talking and uh, <laughs> hand over the mic back to you. Uh, thank you, Nani. That's such a great overview of many of the ways that uh, strategic litigation can um, be impactful in this space. Um, and Jan, I want to turn to you because I think you have a further example um, with respect to the Big Brother case in, in the UK. And if you can start by just giving us a sense of that case. Yes, of course. Jessica, thank you um, very much indeed. And thank you to the Berkman Klein Center for having me today. It's an absolute pleasure to be back at Harvard. Um, Strategic litigation is the way that I came into this area. I'm afraid I was just a boring, conventional human rights lawyer. And, um, and then um, landed on my desk a brief to um, intervene in a case in the United Kingdom, David Miranda. Um, uh, he, of course, was a key actor in breaking the Edward Snowden story about surveillance. So that's where life for me began in terms of considering these sorts of issues. But of course, in that case, um, it was all about the breaking of the story. It was all about whether um, the government could take some of this sensitive information back um, from those seeking to raise awareness um, about these issues. Big Brother was the next step. And um, some, if not all of you in this room will be familiar with that case. It is a case that made it to the European Court of Human Rights. It was a challenge to um, uh, mass surveillance in the United Kingdom. And uh, in terms of thinking about practicalities of strategic litigation, just to give you an idea, obviously you're dealing with technical, technological change um, that is going very, very quickly. Um, we're having to deal with new issues or um, the evolution of existing issues. This is a case that was brought five years ago, and um, judgment was handed down earlier this year. Um, the human rights system, certainly in Europe, under the European Convention, is not well placed to respond very, very quickly um, to these sorts of cases. It's a case in Big Brother that was, relatively speaking, expedited. And of course, before you go to the European Court of Human Rights, you usually have to exhaust domestic remedies, which means you have to have a go in your own courts ordinarily. Um, Big Brother was fascinating because, of course, there is a US angle to um, uh, mass surveillance uh, in the UK, um, putting it lightly. And um, the court um, considered the issues by reference to the way in which the UK had decided to draw the balance between national security on the one hand, the right to privacy, the right to freedom of expression um, in the other. And the court found violations in respect of the right to privacy under Article 8 and the right to freedom of expression under Article 10. It's a, it was just telling Vivek before we started, it's a 212 page judgment. And rather than tell you absolutely everything now, I'm hoping that we can um, explore some of the themes because Europe does not speak with one voice on surveillance. Member states have, uh, both in the European Union and the Council of Europe, um, have differing views about what is and what is not acceptable. But most importantly for today, we need to recognize that there is actually a, um, uh, in places subtle, um, a difference between the approach taken by the European Court of Human Rights, as shown in Big Brother, and the approach taken by the Court of Justice of the European Union, of course not a human rights court, but now has its own charter of fundamental rights. And perhaps ironically, it is the Court of Justice of the European Union that has taken a more rights protective approach to mass surveillance. Um, the European Court has said, look, this is an area where states really have a margin of appreciation, i.e. it's for them in the first instance to balance these considerations, and then we as a supervisory court review it, whereas the Court of Justice of the European Union has said that mass surveillance 
per se cannot be proportionate, right? So that's, that's quite a difference. And I think sometimes in the coverage of these sorts of cases, that's lost. Because of course, with the European Court of Human Rights, there were findings of violations. But one has to look, I think, at, at the detail and see what the court um, uh, did not do. Anyway, I'll just pause there because I could speak for 40 minutes about this case, but hopefully that's an interesting by way of opening on, on, on those cases and the role that strategic lit litigation can play um, uh, in this area. Thank you, Jan, and I think that's a great point to think about um, the competencies and uh, the variety in the case law between courts. Uh, certainly an important consideration when you think, um, as so many of the organizations that um, the Digital Freedom Fund funds, um, about where to file these cases. Um, so uh, I know we have, I, I imagine we have some Europeans in the room. I know we also have a lot of Americans and American lawyers. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to you, Vivek, um, to, uh, to bring this discussion back across the Atlantic. We, of course, promised in the description a European and U.S. perspectives on this uh, and to talk about perhaps some of the ways in which um, the GDPR or um, European case law around these issues has been persuasive here. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jess. I'm delighted to be back uh, in my old stopping grounds, the first classroom that I taught in, actually, uh, many years ago. Um, okay. So to wrap up where what we've discussed, um, I'd like to, to put in your minds the image from Greek mythology of Helen of Troy, uh, but to substitute Edward Snowden's face for Helen of Troy, <laughs> because Edward Snowden kind of launched a thousand different uh, uh, initiatives in the area of, of privacy, right? So that... Uh, applies both to government uh, surveillance, right, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, what enabled the PRISM program and other similar programs was the mass private collection of data, right? So there were two different trends, and Snow the Snowden revelations were the catalytic moment, right? So we're now five years on. We've ha talked about the litigation path um, regarding uh, surveillance, but what's been interesting in, in, in the consumer privacy space is that we started with this idea that the Europeans were way out ahead, uh, and they were, right? So Snowden catalyzed the, the discussions that led to the development of the GDPR. It led to a realization in Europe that the 1995 data directive had what was good, um, but had age and needed reform. Now, what's been very interesting is that Americans and American companies uh, have been very suspicious of the European approach to privacy uh, for a very long time. Right, um, partly uh, for reasons of libertarian political culture in the United States, partly because it fit poorly with our First Amendment traditions, or so we thought. But this has been the year of convergence, I think. So let me take you to California. It's June uh, in Sacramento uh, of this year, and you know, really, almost like a bolt out of the blue, California enacts a very significant uh, privacy law, right? The California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. And it was uh, a great American process that led to that law, which was the threat of a ballot initiative, right? This um, guy, McTaggart, and you know, some other people who are privacy activists in California had collected the signatures that they needed to have a much, a very strong law modeled on the GDPR approach um, to be enacted in California. And ultimately, the legislature, uh, within you know, 48 hours before the deadline, uh, for pulling the measure, they passed a law that was a compromise law that gave a lot of what the uh, McTaggart, the particular catalytic force in this law, wanted. So what we now have in our country's biggest, most populous state, and the state that is the home of the tech companies, is GDPR light. Right? We have a framework that will come into effect in 2020 that is based on the idea of user consent to data processing. It's a data processing kind of approach. Right? It gives users right to access uh, uh, their data, to delete under certain circumstances, to prevent the sale and transfer of data, all kind of weakened, uh, not as strong as in the GDPR, and with some distinctly American features such as a private right of action, so you can go sue uh, if your rights have been violated, as we do in this country. Um, so we now have this interesting convergence. And that convergence, I think, is driven by consumer appetite, but also by the fact that Europe is now such a large market, 
and the business model of major companies is such that it makes sense to comply up, right? Um, so if you're a multinational company, you have to comply with the GDPR. And it's very hard to run your business in a way that um, is going to comply with different standards and different laws in different places, right? So there's going to be growing pains as a company as you sort of grow out of your home market, perhaps in the US, and have to comply with European law. And that's precisely what's driving the convergence. So for the first time in a generation, there is now a serious conversation happening in Washington, DC about a consumer privacy law. Um, senators are holding hearings on it. This is unheard of, right? Six months ago, this seemed impossible, uh, not just for reasons of gridlock in DC, but just because the interests uh, that were pushing against uh, uh, such regulatory innovation in the US were so strong. Uh, we seem to see that logjam breaking. It'll be very interesting to look at what the new Congress does. Um, but to sort of wrap this up, I think, uh, you know, it was very fashionable after the Iraq war to talk about, you know, Europeans being from Venus and Americans being from Mars. And certainly it was that way on privacy for a long time. Uh, but perhaps our differences uh, are overstated in terms of orientation and also where we are seem to be going in terms of the substantive law. Thank you. I think that was a super helpful wrap up. Now, um, interestingly, another connection is that I think that the organizations that you represented in the Big Brother case were American organizations. Can you yes. talk a little bit about that and the role that they had in the case? Yes. Um, I was uh, counsel for um, CDT and PEN American. Uh, in the Big Brother case before the European Court of Human Rights. And in our, one of our chief roles really in the case was to um, fill any US gaps and to assist the court in setting out um, uh, what had happened here in respect of um, uh, the two regimes that were being um, looked at and to make sure that there was n no submissions being made by the United Kingdom government that were out of date. Um, and that was, so we had a, a, quite an American perspective, but it was more in terms of assisting the court to make sure that the court had everything before it, and also trying to put the um, drawbridge down and to explain why this was um, relevant. The court was most interested, I think, to understand the checks and balances over here as it applied to information that was being shared with the United Kingdom government, which makes um, complete um, sense. Um, but um, I mean, aside from that, um, of course, you know, American organizations um, also want to take um, positions of principle in the reasons um, Vivek explained in a, in, a, in a polity that is growing increasingly influential. Um, and I think the European Court of Human Rights is, 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 is one of those polities. Um, another issue that you raised earlier is the question of timing and how fast yes. these technologies evolve in comparison to um, how fast our justice system works. You noted that this, uh, the Big Brother case, which took five years from inception was expedited, right? Um, and that is an expedited, certainly in the US, I don't think we would expect a resolution from the highest competent court uh, in five years. Um, Nani, can you maybe talk a little bit about how um, you and the organizations that the Digital Freedom Fund works with um, think about timing and um, how you plan lawsuits um, with respect to the evolution of technology and, and balancing those two um, very different timelines against each other? That's a really good question. Actually, not one on which you have like a very, you know, standard answer. Um, I think what was interesting about the Big Brother Watch decision is that, I mean, the, the legislation actually changed yes. in the meantime. I mean, it wasn't even technological change. It yes. was that the new, even worse, um, surveillance law had been adopted in the UK in the meantime. However, the issues of principle that the court looked at would apply across different circumstances, right? So I think that in that sense, like if you if you mount um, a strategic case, um, it's important to kind of make sure that you frame it in such a way that, that parts of them, it can be transposed. Like even if, even if the fact pattern that underlied the case originally has changed in the meantime, that there are still, um, you know, 
parts of the judgment that you can still take and make applicable to, to the specific circumstances. Uh, another thing to take into account is that um, justice moves at different paces, right, in different jurisdictions. Um, so, John has mentioned that the Court of Justice of the European Union is actually a really great court to go to with actually many digital rights issues at the moment. Um, we're lucky that we have um, human rights minded judges who get the tech, generally speaking, which is not a thing that we can always say about the European Court of Human Rights. They're working on it, so I'm sure it will improve. Um, but that's a thing that you can think about, right? Particularly if you have a, a directive that applies across the EU, for example. Um, if you want to clarify certain provisions, you can actually be very strategic and think like, wh what would be the national jurisdiction where we'd want to challenge this or where we want to get this elucidated? Um, where would we get, first of all, a, a, an outcome that would be helpful uh, to us? But also, for example, where might we be able to get a referral to the Court of Justice of the European Union? Because within the system there, it's possible for national courts to ask questions to the Court of Justice. and. Uh, basically refer a matter on while you're still in the middle of proceedings nationally. And the approach to that is very different depending on uh, the member state. Uh, so w one of the um, you know, landmark digital rights cases was Max Schramm's Facebook case. Um, so he, um, and, and there's uh, some, of course, a couple of really interesting cases from Ireland as well. Those are jurisdictions that generally are more flexible uh, in referring matters on to the Court of Justice of the European Union. So that's a thing to think about. And if you think about something that could have an impact Europe-wide, you know, would you perhaps be able to f mount a case in one of those jurisdictions uh, initially? So. That's very helpful. Jan, would you like to yeah. follow up? Yes, yeah. I'll follow up on that, um, both by reference to Big Brother and um, um, more generally. What's quite interesting about Big Brother, of course, it wasn't one applicant. It was 15 applications. And um, those 15 applications were grouped, I think, to three groups. And um, the applicants were not all on the same page as to how to deal with this case. And there were a number of applicants who argued that they could go straight to the European Court of Human Rights, i.e. without exhausting domestic remedies. In the case of the UK, that would be the um, IPT, is a specific tribunal um, to rule on these matters. So they went straight to Strasbourg, and there was another group that said, no, no, we've got to exhaust domestic remedies, which I can imagine led to some fraught conversations behind <laughs> closed doors as between um, uh, those groups. But um, so there's that, and I think that is very, very important to get sort of a unified strategy and try to be on the same page. Of course, if you can, if you have to exhaust domestic remedies, you can find a forum where actually, you know, courts are, international courts are slightly more permissive. That's helpful. Um, uh, but ultimately, um, uh, speed is something that is also political when it comes to something like the European Court. If you've got um, advocacy taking place more broadly, especially in some of the related institutions, that can, um, that can make a difference. I mean, in respect of the two courts that um, Nani and I have mentioned, we've been talking about the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights. As Nani mentioned, there is a specific preliminary reference procedure um, which enables a first instance court in a EU state to refer a point of law up to the um, Court of Justice of the European Union. So to stay the proceedings domestically and say, look, we want some guidance on this one issue of law. That can be done, relative, at least in theory, relatively quickly. In any event, it must be a quicker process than having to exhaust all domestic remedies, first instance court, appeal court, Supreme Court, constitutional court, and then bringing an application before the European Court um, of Human Rights. And of course, these two courts are separate. But let's not forget that under the latest um, EU treaty, uh, there is an obligation on the EU to sign up to the European Convention on Human Rights. So whilst the, uh, currently you have two courts and they are separate, um, and you know one is purely a human rights court, the other one has a charter, that relationship may also um, change in due course, just something to think about.
as we continue to look to Europe to look at developments. Thank you, and that's fascinating to think about. I hadn't um, fully processed the implications uh, of that. Um, Vivek, I wonder if we might turn to a different way um, that we can engage um, with governments around issues of tech equity and maybe step actually one one very small step outside of the US and Europe, um, north across the border to Canada, um, <laughs> and also bring in um, issues around um, emerging AI technologies. I wonder sure. if you would talk for just a few minutes about um, the report that you did with some others here um, around uh, AI opportunities and risks. Yeah. So uh, I, we've talked about litigation, we've talked about regulation uh, 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 coming from the top down. Um, the third approach, and this is sort of a, a, a situation that a lot of governments feel themselves in with regard to technology, is um, seeking expertise, right? Because the technology is moving incredibly fast. Um, it's not clear what the implications are, what needs to be regulated, um, and uh, how to do that. So um, the Canadian government um, engaged with us at the Berkman Klein Center to help them try to figure out uh, what to do about AI. Um, and what they wanted us to do is to understand how artificial intelligence, as it's being used in the world today, impacts human rights. And the idea there was to try to understand if this, we are about to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights. So if the modern human rights movement, so that's December 10th, um, so we were taking a 70-year-old body of law um, and seeing what the applicability is of that law to this, you know, the cu most cutting-edge phenomenon uh, that there is right now. Um, so to make it short, you can go uh, download the report if you'd like. It's on the Berkman Klein website. Um, the basic conclusion of the report was that there are a lot of ways to look at the social impacts of AI. We've been having a lot of conversations about AI and ethics, right? Is this an ethical thing to do or not? And uh, one of the thrusts of the report was to say, well, you know, we could also talk about it in terms of human rights. Human rights are a body of law that is established, and we just discussed for the last half an hour how you can litigate human rights claims, how human rights laws can be enacted. So there's something in that experience that allows us to say that, look, these are impacts. These are good consequences or bad consequences, and the bad ones could be actionable. Right, um, so we did that mapping for six current uses of AI um, in the world today, right? From medical diagnostics to uh, the way that credit uh, is now extended, right? Through not just a conventional credit score, but th there are companies out there that look at thousands of variables uh, that are beyond conventional credit scoring and are kind of unregulated, right? And those have impacts uh, on people's rights. Uh, including the right to non-discrimination, but other ones, a, a lot of other rights too. Um, so that was one part of the mapping. But at the same time, um, there are questions that AI, like any new technology, raises that are very difficult to answer using the current law. And a great example of this is we found Criminal justice is a great example. There's a lot of conversation here in the US about algorithms and criminal justice being used in sentencing. And um, you know, you can set, so there are some basic trade-offs in that are in the nature of how an algorithm is programmed uh, that you can maximize for some things but not for others. So, you know, to make a hard case, um, if you have an algorithm that's going to reduce the prison population overall by 30%, but increase racial disparities by 1%, which means that all ethnic groups are going to have a lower rate of incarceration, but the gap between, let's say, the majority and minority increases, what do you do? Um, we actually, there's no coherent answer yet in human rights on what to do there, right? So we need to, there are processes we could use. Part of the point was that, yeah, you can go litigate that. We get a bunch of smart judges to uh, speak on it. And or, as a society, we need to make some decisions, right? So the purpose of the report was really to start that conversation. Um, and it's interesting that a government went to an external group to do that thinking. Uh, and Canada and a few other countries are starting to develop national AI policies um, that are trying to get their heads around this very um, you know, powerful but generalizable technology, right? It's kind of an empty vessel into which you can feed data and it's gonna, it's gonna learn. 
Um, so that's a really difficult kind of public policy challenge to deal with. And it's great that governments are thinking about that um, at the beginning of the technology rather than when it's uh, in much wider use. Thank you. So um, sensitive of the time, I want to move us to perhaps like one stage even further away from if we start at litigation, which is sort of <laughs> a after the fact using the mechanisms of the state to redress grievances, thinking about advising states. Um, now perhaps I'd like to think, ask each of you in turn to think about um, the most productive ways that you have seen in the space of advocating for fairness, equity, and human rights in tech of engaging directly with the companies. Um, so uh, Nani, can I start with you? Um, any particular um, ideas that you have? And I'll offer one provocation as a possible thing that's been in the news for you to respond to. What are your thoughts about Facebook's proposed content moderation Supreme Court? <laughs> <laughs> As a future president of that Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> would you, yeah, would amazing. Would you accept a seat on it? Probably not. Probably not. No. <sighs> okay. <laughs> so this is a... The reason that I find this a difficult question to answer is because um, I just haven't seen any examples yet of, of really successful um, efforts. And I, I now I'm sitting next to... Uh, g and I uh, participants, um, I think those are nice initiatives. I just don't think that they have sufficient teeth. Um, what I actually think is that what we need for tech companies is similar types of regulations as we have for financial companies. Uh, and I think until we have that kind of framework in place, everything else is, is nice, but it's just not going to have um, the impact that we need. So, yeah. I'm just going to leave it there for a moment and pass on the microphone to whoever wants it. <laughs> uh, I actually wanted to, to ask uh, John a question because there's media regulation in the UK, which I think yes. is quite interesting. But uh, So um, a lot of what I do um, is working with companies uh, and 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 getting them in the same room as government and their civil society interlocutors to try to set some standards. So the leading one, we call these multi-stakeholder organizations. It's a terrible word. I wish someone would come up with a better uh, term that's less of a mouthful. The gauntlet has been dropped. Um, uh, the Global Network Initiative is the leading one in the tech space, and it formed about a decade ago um, to basically... Um, set some ground rules for how tech companies protect the free expression and privacy rights of their users against the government, right? So I think it's been relatively successful in doing so. And the success is less seen in terms of, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of news coverage. Many of you have probably never heard of it before. Um, and it's hard to devise metrics of success. But what's interesting to me is that being part of these organizations has changed how companies make decisions internally. Uh, so there's a lot of process that happens now inside a company. And you could actually see this um, in the strangest of places in the Intercept story yesterday about Google's Dragonfly project, right? Which you think, my god, here's a company that is doing completely the wrong thing um, in designing this uh, search engine that is uh, easy to censor for the Chinese government, right? But what's interesting about that story is that it describes the process that Google had to do a privacy review and about how this you know, uh, mid-level person, presumably, who was going to do that was squashed by the high-level person who was trying to drive the project forward. And there was an internal fight in the company, as we see playing out in the media and in public protests by employees now. But I think that is exactly the, uh, that's a sign that there was, the process works in some way, that there was an internal voice and a business process that said, hey, wait a minute, right? Rather than just sort of blundering in and then the thing leaking. So, you know, one cheer for multi stakeholderism. <laughs> Great. I mean, I'm singularly the worst equipped person to answer this because, um, <laughs> because I, I think this is an area of law that um, uh, really challenges r current structures on the provision of legal advice. And I actually think, uh, based on my own experience the last three or four years, in-house counsel, 
um, have become increasingly sophisticated because they've had to. And there are certain areas where, in fact, um, um, those not operating in-house, so those in private practice, have had to catch up a little bit. Obviously, no one in this room, save for myself. Um, but I, I think that um, certainly in the United Kingdom, I feel that that's where we are. I feel we almost have an outmoded <coughs> system to discuss these things. Um, but um, things are moving. I mean, in terms of effects, um, I mean, I participated um, uh, at a media uh, roundtable, um, but it was Chatham House, so I can't say anything about it. But it was fascinating to see just how much thought had gone into um, obligations on publishers, mm -hmm. on GDPR, and under the na new data protection um, uh, legislation in the United Kingdom. It's meant to um, marry GDPR, but there's, there's a real shift. There's a real shift. Um, previously, it used to be a court that would um, uh, consider an editor's compliance. It no longer is. It's now the um, media publisher who has that obligation. That's a huge shift internally as to the way that companies have to um, grapple with these issues, both structurally and you know, potentially um, uh, substantively um, as well. So I'm afraid I think it's a watch this space. Um, but it is, it's moving very, very quickly. And, you know, as someone who still wears a wig for his profession um, and has just about got a laptop, I think we've, we've got to catch up, certainly at the London Bar. So now to kind of backtrack on my initial comments, but it's, it's all pieces of the puzzle. I just think that, uh, and all of that, those are positive. Um, I just think that as long as we're in a situation where there's actually no clear regulation of the behavior of platforms, and they are clearly not putting enough resources into addressing the issues that are there. There are efforts and so on, but I think for companies that have such huge annual turnovers, the amount of resources that are actually being allocated to address the issues, it's nice to have policies, it's nice to have processes, but you know, their stories keep on coming out about you know, um, all sorts of uh, misconduct. And I, yeah, I, I just feel that until there's, there's a clear framework that also allows for proper enforcement, um, we, we, st we will still have a problem. Um, Can I just follow up on that? I, I actually took us off piece. I just realized how much off piece I took us. But the, the um, Facebook Supreme Court, the details which um, I've not read, mm -hmm. but it opens up, I think, a real divide in approach between Europe and, uh, and the US. And um, I wonder if, they, if that this will see a convergence. But in, there is such a suspicion here of regulation that comes through government on content. Um, that's not the same starting point in Europe, um, but it's obviously something that has to be dealt with. I mean, Facebook is a fantastic example. What's, what's the answer? Where are the two starting points? Do we look to the state? Do we look to Facebook itself as the starting point? If there's going to be a Supreme Court, then what's the relationship between that Supreme um, uh, Court and state actors, um, what's the supervision at the level of the state? Who is in charge of supervising that? Is it a new jurisdiction or is it an old jurisdiction that needs to um, uh, deal with these massive entities in a, in, in a certain way? I mean, there are real structural questions, mm -hmm. I think, that needs to be addressed. And I'm not sure, in terms of general convergence, I think that is an area where there's got to be some conversations because it just seems that sort of two ends of the spectrum in terms of at least a starting point for that conversation. This conversation is fascinating and I hesitate to interrupt it, but I do want to save time for questions if there are any. Yep. Here, microphone coming to you. The switch is on the bottom, Kendra. No. Here, here's one. Sorry. Yep. I had a slightly different <clears throat> question on the overlap of the transatlantic issues involving GDPR. Um, in my work, I've worked with Harvard as an institution on on how sort of groups that have our U.S. law and and GDPR applying can sort of work together. 
and there's a lot of disconnect in terms of the you know U.S. privacy law is very much patchwork. GDPR is very much sort of principle based, and and also differences on what they protect. You know, for example, you know sexual orientation, political party membership, and union membership are protected under GDPR. They they aren't here, and it seems very hard to figure out how how groups that have to follow both regimes can work. Do, do you have any thoughts on how those might better overlap, if that makes sense? Um, other than hiring me? Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it, that's a really hard challenge, right? And there's a reason that privacy lawyers have been incredibly busy for the last year, right? Because you're absolutely right. So GDPR covers everyone and everything, right? It, but it's a framework. Um, that that says like here is how you should treat data and here are the kinds of data that fall. It doesn't matter who you are, as long as you are a data processor or you are holding the data, et cetera, you have obligations, right? In the US, our approach is more sectoral. So in health data, right? Um, if you are Apple and you're collecting my heartbeat information, right, there's almost no law that covers you. Whereas if you go to a doctor and a doctor issues you um, some kind of device to you know check your heart, and that's going into the doctor's file. Then HIPAA, right, which is our federal health privacy law, does apply, right? It varies a bit, and then it varies state to state. Some some states will say Apple does have an obligation. Some do, some will say it doesn't, right? So, I mean, the uh, what we would do, you know, if we were providing legal advice to a client, is to First, map the data that you have, right? What kinds of data are you collecting? And then, you know, and where are you geographically? And then, you know, what legal requirements apply to your handling of that data? And then at some point, you have a choice. Are you going to distinguish based on where the people are? Or are you going to try to level up, right? And create a framework inside your institution that allows you with one mechanism to comply with multiple regimes, right? And that's, I think, where companies are moving to as a practical matter, right? So, for example, it is possible to comply with HIPAA and the GDPR with regard to health data, right? Uh, don't sell it, <laughs> right? Don't give it away without the user's consent. Um, so you can sort of figure out what, what, you know, what kinds of um, protections and compliance mechanisms you have around that data to comply with both. Um, so this is sort of a question going to, um, someone made the point earlier about the Marriott breach. Um, and I think one of the observations is, um, to some extent, sort of the major players in sort of personal data space generally do, I mean, putting aside how they use the data, they do a much job, better job of protecting it. Google and Facebook, for example. Um, and so do you think there's, uh, and this kind of goes back to the point about distrust of, especially in the U.S., of sort of inst government institutional hold over that kind of data. But do you think there's a role for some sort of data brokerage? And I think this has been floated in the past. People have, gov some governments have said it would be nice to have a neutral, trusted third party that could handle people's data in a way that they would trust them. Is that something which is attractive, at all practical, plausible, or just science fiction? Nani, you brought up the Marriott breach in the first case, and you've been the one arguing for the regulation with teeth. Do you want to handle this one? Yeah, I can't really answer that. I mean, that was as an example. Um, sorry, I, I, I'm just not equipped to, to answer that. That's a broader policy question that is outside of my area of expertise. Jan, Vivek? Um, what I would say, I think it's, it's very hard to think of the idea of lots of different companies and social actors giving up their data. Um, that being said, as a practical matter, um, we're all moving to the cloud, yeah. right? So, you know, even a sophisticated service like Dropbox or Evernote, right? So these are companies that handle a lot of our data. They don't handle it themselves. They contract out the storage and the security to Amazon and Google. So effectively, most of the world's data is being held 
uh, by Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, right? Including government data, which is why the HQ2 of Amazon is outside Washington, D.C. So as a practical matter, those are the companies um, whose architectures are protecting data against hacking, right? Um, now, with a, with a caveat, right? There's different ways that you can deploy uh, uh, your so you know, software as a service or infrastructure as a service, you know, if you're in the cloud. Um, so it'll be interesting to find out more about the Marriott breach and how that happened. But I think there is a movement toward uh, more sort of centralization of security as a practical matter, because unless you're really on top of the ball, you can't manage that cybersecurity risk. I, mean, I was just going to put my dystopian novel reading hat on, <laughs> um, but to make that point far less um, eloquently, I mean, if you push everything into so the all eggs in one basket and then security concerns um, uh, obviously um, come come to the fore. But I, um, uh, in anticipation of today, I um, read, I read something um, just in terms of this trust point that you um, come to, and it might be that Ron's heard about this already, but... Um, Uber was fined in, in, in the United Kingdom quite recently at up to £385,000 um, um, because it had not disclosed the existence of a data breach after um, it had it was become the victim of a cyber attack. So rather than telling customers and drivers, they spent a hundred grand paying off the people who had actually enacted breach and asking them to delete whatever it is that they um, stole. So, I mean, it's the sort of thing that you, you know, might read in a tabloid and think, oh, well, that must, that can't possibly be right. But, I mean, I think trust is absolutely key and, um, I mean, everything pushing up to the cloud, it's the same. We've been talking about sort of legal privilege issues, the fact that even, you know, a small barrister's chambers in London now, everything is accessible and query and we get, you know, there are attempts to hack us and we're not a particularly important organization. Um, in the general scheme of things, I should add. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a serious issue, a serious issue. Thank you. Any, uh, I, we have time for one more question, if there is one. Oh, you have another, great, terrific. Just in terms of reading the tea leaves, what happens if the UK has a hard exit from Brexit and just drops out? Would they still keep GDPR, do you think? Well, that, that, that is the big question um, in respect of the EU withdrawal um, bill. I guess I'd reverse it and say, what on earth happens if they don't? How does that work? And I do not think that um, enough thought has gone to that. So we'll have to see how the bill goes. Um, but seeing as we have a brand new data protection law, which was enacted this year, um, it might be seen as a retrograde, a pretty mass retrograde step to then enact something brand new um, thereafter. It will be practically impossible for them to be able to continue with their services and business if they don't. So I, I just don't quite see how from a practical perspective that, you know, even if they don't say, make it as explicit as saying we adhere to the GDPR, they will have to have, you know, the same type of rules in force because um, whenever they want to do business with any, <laughs> any type of customer or other organizations outside of their borders, they would have to be able to comply, so, yeah. Thank you. Well, um, we bit off a big um, topic for this hour. Um, fairness, equity, human rights, and tech from the US to the EU. Um, and I particularly loved, Nani, what you said about the necessity for there to be action on various fronts, right? Um, whether it is from human rights advocates who have a suspicion of multi-stakeholder organizations and the company's own efforts um, acting simultaneously alongside those organizations as they move these things forward. Uh, these issues are so complex. Um, both the legislation, the regulation, and the technology is moving quickly. Um, and so I think it's very exciting um, to have uh, US and European lawyers more closely in dialogue, um, more closely coordinated with relation to your Berkman project um, and working with governments as um, Vivek and your, the rest of your team here at Berkman did um, with the Canadian government um, to push these issues forward. So thank all three of you for being with us.
here today. And um, thanks all of you for being here to, to listen. <laughs>